Greetings, hacksters, and happy Friday. Um, oh, I keep meaning to do a 30-minute prior uh, intro thing so that people know when to join, but alas, no. Uh, we're just rolling into the weekend with an exciting new project that I've been working on. It's exciting to me for obvious reasons. Uh, I've been working on this Jewel Thief PCB that you've seen on the site before, probably, um, which allows you to run projects on dead batteries, uh, be those AA, AAA, or CR2032, all with this PCB that I designed and released back in April for Earth Day. And uh, of course, a circuit is only good as the projects that you can run on it. So uh, the default one has a spot for an LED, so you can turn this into a little night light or you know, a little flashlight or whatever you want. But you can also break that out into uh, another project if you have something else that you want to run on it. And uh, over the past oh, let's see, five months. It's been, um, I've had so many different ideas, but really uh, what struck me recently was that we have all these LED tea lights sitting around from my housemate's project and they come in all different shapes and sizes. So these are the three that I was looking at just from, these ones were already in my house. Uh, and so these are ones that my housemate used for an art project a while ago. We have a bajillion of these. They just needed a little bit of cleaning up. This one is a bit more fancy. It comes as part of a set and you can turn them all on and off. Well, actually, even these basic ones you can. Um, but these ones can be controlled with a remote control uh, and you can control multiple of them at once that way, but you still have to leave them on in between them with their little radio receiver going and they only run on a CR2032 coin cell battery, which does not last super long, let me tell you. So in between um, uses, honestly, even just while they're sitting there waiting for me to use them, they tend to run down. Uh, and I haven't replaced the batteries in them and they just sit around even though they're kind of a gorgeous, you know, atmospheric effect. Uh, and then there's these other ones that are a little bit more basic, which uh, are sort of similar. They've got this little rocking flame situation going on, some candle flicker LEDs and all that good stuff. Um, but, you know, with all of these sitting around, it seems like the perfect candidate for the Jewel Thief because they take a small amount of energy, uh, but not insignificant. You know, they'll eat up, eat through those batteries like nothing. And um, <laughs> in the Jewel Thief PCB tutorial, there's a little bit of a, a long-winded detour uh, around my personal history with the origin of this circuit which is kind of cool for me personally but yeah um i give a vague description of how the jewel thief works and link you to a better one that's online but you can also see big clive's original one he's the one who coined the term jewel thief this is a circuit that originally was submitted to an electronics magazine back in 1999 by someone called zed or z kaparnik from swin in england and um, then sort of gained a lot of popularity around when Big Clive uh, began talking about it on his channel on YouTube and made a couple of PCBs for making the Vampire Torch based on it. Uh, there's so many great potential names for this circuit. Personally, I think that it should be called the Magic Roundabout uh, to sort of honor its heritage. But yeah, uh, all kinds of different stuff. So that's what the PCB looks like right here. Uh, and my smiling face. And uh, as part of the sustainability uh, angle here, you can use it as an earring as well. Like lots of my circuits, uh, you can wear them even if they don't come out perfectly. <laughs> so um, I'm bringing it back again because September is Sustainability Month on Hackster. Uh, if you haven't noticed, we're publishing a lot of extra stuff around sustainability, and this is partly leading up to our uh, impact Summit in October. So the Hackster Impact Summit is going to be on the 11th and 12th of October. It's free. It's virtual. Join us there. In fact, I'm going to pull up that link as well because it's very exciting to me. Personally. Hackster Impact Summit. You can just look it up online or I'll put the link in the description below. Don't know why I didn't think to do that before the video, but there we go. <laughs> it's a Friday. Um, be sure to go register for that. I'm very excited. We've got some really cool speakers coming up. We'll be announcing soon and some cool sponsors that are joining us. We're going to be doing a version of the Hangout and Nerd Out that we did for Wearables Month last month. And we're also going to be having some special editions of Hackster Cafe, plus some demos from the community. So all kinds of cool stuff, all organized around uh, air and water pollution, preventing it, monitoring it, things like that. Very cool. So. Oh, you can even, the agenda's up now. I love it. So uh, yeah, 
Sustainability Month on Hackster, uh, you can go to our sustainability channel, which is already linked below. But I think you want to stick around here for a minute because I got some cool stuff to show you. Uh, and then also celebrate Sustainability Month with these environmentally focused product projects. We have a link to this article of just a bunch of cool projects on Hackster. Love it. So back to the task at hand. Actually, first up, um, I always forget to say this, but if you like this kind of thing, be sure to subscribe. I'm going to show you my face close up because what you should do is if you like watching these, you should come to our YouTube channel if you're not there already and hit the subscribe button. If you're here already, it's right there. Just hit the subscribe button. It's super easy and make sure you get notifications because I love talking to you and seeing all your comments. Tariq, I'm great. Thank you. I'm very excited that it's Friday and uh, I love that everyone's jumping in on the comments. So, without further ado, the Jewel Thief LED tea light adapter uh, is exactly what it says on the tin, and I'm going to walk you through how it works and how I built it. Um, you can go to the link in the description. Uh, there's a link to that circuit board that I showed you a minute ago. <laughs> we have a rowdy street situation going on. Um, links back to the Jewel Thief. You can find info about it on Wikipedia. You can find the exact 3D printed model that I'm using here. So it's basically made of two parts. Um, and I always design my stuff in on shape because I love it. They don't pay me or anything. I just love it. Um, it is pretty simple. So your LED tea light obviously goes in the top here. I measured all three of the ones that I have to make sure that they work well. It's about 41 millimeters across this little depression on the top here. And that uh, can accommodate the largest and fanciest of my tea lights here, the one with the little drips on it and the remote control. But also it can accommodate the smallest one here. And it doesn't look stupid uh, as far as I think <laughs> aesthetics are very important. And then you've got the slot down here because what you're going to do is open up the uh, LED, the battery compartment, pardon me, on the bottom of the uh, LED candle. Let's have a look there. So all of these basically, whether it's like a little you know, grabby thing like that, or it's one of these horrible things that you have to use your fingernails on. <laughs> Either way, you're going to end up with a CR2032 coin cell battery on the bottom, usually a switch uh, that's also on here. If you want to get more intense with the disassembly, you can actually reuse that switch. And I kind of designed this with a deep enough hole over here that you can fit whatever kind of switch is in here. Um, but in this case, I've just decided to reuse to use a uh, one that I had lying around because it's a lot less sort of hacking on the original, and I wanted to show the sort of very simplest way of doing this, which I think is quite friendly. You take the battery out of here, and you um, let's actually do it. I'm not going to solder up another one of these because uh, winding the jewel thief coils takes forever. But yeah, um, usually if there's a contact on the side, that's your positive contact. Deltron 3030. <laughs> positive contact. Um, this side of the battery, positive. See how it wraps around here? That's usually your positive. This flat part uh, on the bottom is your ground. So that's going to be your ground contact. You're going to solder to both of those. Make sure the switch is left on because that when you way when you you're basically switching the power further downstream towards the battery. Um, and so you want to have this on so that when that power starts flowing, uh, it automatically gets put through to the LED. And then, you know, you take that, uh, you take those wires, you route them through this slot to the bottom, like so. They come out through the slot, you put the jewel thief circuit in the bottom here. And here I'll switch to the one that I've already done. It's like in a cooking show where I've already had this one in the oven. I did it earlier today. And I'm going to try and make my uh, thing blow out less. Just so that it's a little bit more visible, especially because we're going to have some LEDs coming on in a second. Um, what I've done with this one is actually, uh, you're basically using this LED tea light candle to replace the LED that you may have soldered in place on the Jewel Thief circuit. So the PCB comes with a spot to put an LED in it, right? And you're basically just replacing that with an LED tea light. In this case, I've left the LED on and also connected the tea light because it can easily power both. Um, but yeah, that's what you would do. And I have info about that on the tutorial. Let's take a look. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so here you can see where the LED is attached to the top. We're just turning that into a candle. 
Um, let's take another look. So that's what these two wires are. See how they're coming in through the slot in the bottom there? Up to the top. And I've just sort of foam taped this candle in place. It's easily removable if I want to swap it out with something else. And then uh, the brightness here is really killing me. I'm sorry, folks. But uh, I got to show you uh, in a little bit more detail. Because a lot of this stuff is very dark that I've printed with. Um, and also the PCP is a dark purple. So the Jewel Thief is also switched on. Uh, if you've attached a switch to it already, otherwise you would just solder it permanently in the on position if you want to use it in this circuit. It's very important that all the switches for the LED tea light, for the Jewel Thief, are on. And then you're just going to make sure that you're breaking and connecting the circuit with this switch. Um, this is where you would usually connect the battery to the Jewel Thief. And that's exactly what we've done here with these other wires, routed them out and around uh, to here, where this one connects to the ground side of the battery, this one connects to the positive side, and then you have a little switch. And let's turn this on. Woo! <laughs> it's so magical! Okay, so um, a little bit about how this is constructed, and I'm going to get our focus into shape here so that we can see what we're doing. <laughs> There we go. So uh, we've got our switch over here. And the way that we've connected the battery is it's printed in two parts. There is a slot here on the right. This is an earlier version before I realized I needed a lot more space for the ferrite toroid to sit in here and also the wires to get routed. Uh, so there's a clip that gets pushed into here. And it's sort of a little C shape. And that provides the springiness, the tension against the battery. And then I've also con uh, covered that with conductive tape. <laughs> Originally, I started out with soldering to copper tape, which is easy to solder to and nice and easy to stick to things. But I realized that there wasn't enough tension in the circuit to hold the battery in there and make sure that there was a good connection because it kept turning off. And so I had to add a few layers of maker tape. And I'm going to show you that in a second as well. But yeah, basically, um, you know, instead of hooking up a battery directly to the Jewel Thief, we're hooking it up through this power switch. And instead of soldering an LED onto the Jewel Thief, um, we're going to leave it there. Or you might not soldering it, solder it on it at all in the first place. And we're going to put that LED tea light in there. So now that is on. And it's beautiful and homey. And we're just using up dead batteries. That's all we're doing. It's stuff that wouldn't run, you know, another flashlight or whatever. But the Jewel Thief is just this magical way of... Uh, Obviously, it's not actually magic, but it is, in my view, a very magical circuit uh, that allows you to amplify the voltage that is coming through this circuit and be able to run uh, projects off of it, even though the battery is supposedly dead. So I have just a huge number of batteries at home that uh, I'm ready to drop in here at a moment's notice. And let's talk about a couple more things here. Um, so here's what this looks like when you haven't got the components in it. You can see that I've routed these things around. Uh, there's a slot coming from the uh, candle depression at the top to the bottom. This is a horribly <laughs> failed previous print. This was also an experiment in printing with closed loop plastics, which is a recycled filament. And it turns out that this U-hips plastic, um, I was still using some PLA settings on this, I think, by accident. And so that's why it cracked apart like this. It needs much higher heat. And so uh, I also had some issues with it pulling up off of the print bed. This is pretty warped. Uh, but we got there in the end. So just use higher heat. But this uh, filament is very cool. It's like a, as you said, recycled U-hips filament from, uh, I believe, plastic cups that comes from closed loop plastics. And here's another previous version. I just like showing off the, you know, how far we've come basically. I think this this one came first. I ran out of filament. This is some previous PLA that I was trying to use up, but I didn't have quite enough. Uh, th but you know, it was good to be able to verify the size of things and uh, make sure that the shapes of the other things were coming out well. I knew I needed to get rid of some of the density of this support material so it'd come out more easily. This guy came out next, uh, obviously a little trouble with the printing. This one came out and had a lot of serious warping. And I also realized that I hadn't, I hadn't yet actually figured out the clip part, uh, the mechanism to provide um, some springiness and tension against the battery. This was just sort of a proof of concept and it was useful in that way. 
this guy was my second to last one. Still issues with not printing hot enough. So, you know, you can see this sort of struggling to squeeze out the melted filament and also how these are not melted really enough. So they, they don't look uniform. Uh, and this wasn't deep enough either. But we had this the general idea going. And you can see how I had this spot for the clip, but I didn't have any way to dig out the filament from it. So there's still some filament left down in there, I think. Um, and this is a bit broken because I couldn't get it out without sort of digging in there. So this new version has, uh, I'll just show you. The new version has this slot here so that I can just get in there with the tweezers and dig out the support filament. That's all that's for. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, your little C-shaped clip here is what holds the battery in. It gets sort of rotated 90 degrees and stuck in here. Uh, and it slopes down in such a way that it's easy to uh, insert and remove the battery because you've got this nice smooth slope. Um, here's the routing. I learned recently how to do uh, screw helix threading in Onshape. And it has to do with creating a profile and a sweep. So the profile is the sort of cylindrical shape that I made here in this sketch. And then you sweep it along a path that I drew in a sketch on this face. Uh, so it just cuts out that semicircle shape out of, along this path. And then it helps to fillet those edges so that the wire isn't getting sort of abraded. And also uh, I made sure to extend my sweep path beyond the box that I was sweeping into because I noticed that there were some issues with it not removing all the material that it needed to. It would like stop short of the face where it needed to intersect with the box. So you got to make sure that you're careful with that. I could show you really quick and then I'm going to undo it. But if I put this path right up against there, see, it's getting swept along this path. Doo -doo -doo. Then we will end up with a partial occlusion of this uh, little routing channel. So to avoid that, you just make sure that the path comes into the box past that face and it all works out more nicely. What else? There's another little channel where I can dig out the filament from this box, which is for the switch, but also that is so that I can stick the wire through and what I've used here, actually, is instead of cutting a whole other length of wire to go from the switch to the main body for the battery, I've just used a cut-off resistor leg, because it's longer than an LED leg, I think. Uh, that's why I think it's a resistor leg. I just dumped them all into a little container I have here. Mentioned this in a stream a couple of days ago, but I have this, you know, box of headers and stuff. But in here, I also keep a bunch of little cut-off LED and resistor legs for just making little quick short connections like that. You don't have to strip anything. You just make sure that you hold it with tweezers so you don't burn your fingers. And there you go. I'm not sure how long this will last, but it probably depends on how dead the battery was to start with. So yeah, um, just to review, we were just looking at where the uh, wires are swept through. Can I focus up closer again? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. We were just looking at where the wires are swept through. That's the one where the occlusion was when I changed it. Here's the other one. Here's the switch, sort of buried in there. Here's the, you can't really see it, but there's a little resistor leg that's swept through this hole over here and soldered onto the conductive tape. And then, uh, yeah, the clip is in here with more conductive tape on it and extra layers of maker tape to hold it in place more tightly. So let's take a look at those tapes really quick. Where do I put them? Here we go. I used two different kinds of conductive tape in here. The first one, I was just using this copper tape, um, which is great, but it's a little bit flimsy and it tends to stick to itself and get kind of bent up and all that good stuff. But it is very easy to solder to, so I liked starting out with that one. It isn't the greatest at adhering to the filament either. So um, it's actually kind of a good thing that I ended up putting this maker tape over it. So this is a product from Brown Dog Gadgets. And we've talked about it a few times on the channel before, but it basically is a sort of nylon tape with conductive materials. 
and uh, it's very flexible, very much like a fabric, very durable. You can yank on this all day and it won't break. And also it's Z-axis conductive. It's conductive through the tape, not just sort of this way and that way. So you can run lengths of it and connect things, but you can connect things that are on top of each other, which is such a huge advancement over most copper tape for which the adhesive is usually not conductive. So you can't just like lay tape on top of tape and expect it to conduct through. Uh, but this stuff you can. So that's why I've stuck that on top uh, in this prototype to make sure that it, um, to add some extra thickness but it conducts all the way through down to the copper tape and then uh, your circuit is complete. I did want to show you the maker tape site. Um, and let's just see if there's any questions so far about the modeling or the circuit or anything like that. I'm not going to attempt to once again describe the Jewel Thief circuit because that has uh, gotten me in trouble before. Cool recycled filament. Oh yes, I was going to show you the closed loop plastics filament. So let me pull that up really quick. And I'll also pull up the maker tape. Closed loop plastic nebula black u hips filament. Maker tape, quarter inch. Here we go. So first off, here is the closed loop plastics nebula black u hips 3D printing filament, which I use. Um, used for this project. Anyway, it's from I got it from Matter Hackers. There's a number of other recycled filaments coming out as well, including some recycled PLA, I think, which might be easier for me in the future. Um, as I always mentioned, PLA is sometimes celebrated for being um, uh, Di biodegradable, but the issue is that you have to have it in a sort of industrial or municipal uh, composting facility rather than trying to compost it in your backyard because it requires extra temperature and pressure that you're just not going to achieve on your own. The U-Hips is recycled in the first place, um, but I, I found it a little bit more difficult to work with, but I think that that's also just because I need to make sure that I'm using um, a hot enough setting so there's also these other colors there's party pink <laughs> and nebula black that's what you get um my guess is that this is made from solo cups post-consumer plastic cups and lids you know each spool is produced in long beach california where plastic waste from the community is given new life as 3d printer filament for makers engineers and enthusiasts everywhere and it's also pretty affordable look at that often you'll see like a kilogram of stuff for about 40 bucks depending on depending on what you're looking at 25 is like not unusual but it is good it's not like a super stupendously expensive filament and it's wonderful look at that totally solo cups <laughs> and the maker tape is over here so this is the brown dog gadgets maker tape which we've fe featured a number of times on the channel and i might link to some of those in the description after this as well haven't used on shape yet. Mostly used Fusion 360 so far. I started learning 3D modeling on Fusion 360, and I think it is a great, pardon me, application. It's really cool how it uh, can interface directly with Eagle and um, some other of Autodesk's tools now that they've been acquired by them. I think that Fusion 360 is a great tool, but I like the I like the flexibility of Onshape because I don't have to worry about file versions. <laughs> I know that when I go to the tool, it's going to be the most recent version of the file. And uh, it has lots of the same features as Fusion. It has a slightly different way of doing things, but you've still got a similar thing to the history over here. You know, where you can sort of go back in time. If I'm working on this sketch, it'll just show me what existed when I did that sketch. And then once you're done making your tweaks, it'll like update everything to the present. And uh, I just love the shape of this thing. It's really fun to play with. It's very simple, actually. How did I do this? I did. <laughs> oh, you know what? I think I did it with bevels or chamfers, rather. Um, so we can walk through it, actually. So here's sketch three. Um, <laughs> extrude three. That was the box on the bottom. Some sketches, some sweeps. Those are more stuff from the bottom. Fillets. Those are also uh, when I was making those channels. And then here are the chambers on the top. Okay, so I extruded that slot all the way through. Then we started making the shape of the thing. First with these curved chamf chamfers along the sides of this. Uh, 
I don't know if this is actually a rouleau triangle. It looks like one. A rouleau triangle is a triangle that's the same width uh, at every angle. Any way you turn it, it's the same width, so almost as though it were a circle, but it's not as a triangle. It's really cool. Um, so that was the first chamfer. And then the second chamfer over here, going like that. And there was a third one. I think that was just the inside of the depression here at the top, yeah. So you get this kind of cool sci-fi effect just by doing some chamfers. And I really love this technique because it, it comes out with a really beautiful, clean aesthetic, but also not just like a boring shape. I love it. Ah, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> love seeing the growth of recycled and upcycled filament types. Yes. Uh, Darian is, uh, oh, it's Darian. Oh, hey. Uh, Darian is such a cool guy. Uh, where's the minute? Um, I've still got the newt on my desk here. It's been a while since I actually used it because I stopped using it for the, the tracking that I was doing, but Darian makes this really cool um, thing called, the, I promise I will answer your question, <laughs> but you just got to see this really awesome little desktop um, sort of companion that Darian has made with its own OS with these little touch buttons and uh, a LiPo battery holder connector and USB-C and this amazing little, you know, living hinges, flexi uh, wood holder. Love it. And I still keep this on my desk. It's one of my favorite things. Um, and one of the most functional pieces of desktop technology that I've found. Okay, enough about that. <laughs> um, is Onshape free to use? Yes, it is. Uh, so I stay on the free version. Um, it is free with the caveat that your designs are public. I've never had an issue that I've noticed with anyone ripping off one of my designs. And also, actually, I love that part of it because it's very easy to share stuff. So, uh, you know, anyone, I've, I've shared this link here, do do do, and I can copy that easily. And anyone can uh, go find that and export it and print it. And it'll update when I update it. And I don't have to re-upload anything anywhere. Uh, I can just share this and it'll be uh, the most recent version in perpetuity, which I think that Fusion also has some features like that. Um, in fact, it used to infuriate me when I was working with it. I think they've changed this. But you could model locally, which you can't do with Onshape. You cannot model offline. But Fusion used to require you to go online to export your model. Like you could model everything, but then in order to export, you'd have to like connect up to the internet, have it like upload to their servers. They'd, they'd um, I think, turn it into an actual model on the servers and then you'd download it from the server. Uh, and that just drove me bananas. So here at least, um, I think they changed that. So no shade. Um, I haven't used Fusion in a number of years just because Honestly, just this is comfortable for me. Uh, it does what I need it to do. Um, Tinkercad is a great place for people to start out, but uh, it has some issues with parametric design. You can't get as precise with it. I actually made something again recently, a little phone holder with Tinkercad. I'm getting off track here, but I promise we'll wrap up soon. Um, this is just like a little egg shape that I turned into a little guy that can hold your phone. Also, that cracking problem because I didn't have the nozzle hot enough. Um, but, you know, it's very simple to throw together cute little things like this in Tinkercad. But, uh, you know, if you want to get it to be parametric at all, or if you're trying to go back and forth and change things at different stages in the process, you will rip your hair out, <laughs> I promise you. But it is really cool because it also can interact with uh, circuitry. They have some interlacing. I think that actually Autodesk also bought Tinkercad. Could be wrong. But um, now they interact with all their other products and stuff. So Tinkercad is another great option, if especially if you're like new to 3D modeling and you want something. Uh, Onshape is free. Um, yes. <laughs> but if you want your designs to be private, then you probably need to pay for it. Fusion still does, I think, for some SDLs. I'm curious as to where I was in my little rant <laughs> when you said that. I think what you are referring to is when I said that it requires you to connect to the internet and upload your model in order to export the, uh, the STL. And I'm going to guess that that's what you mean. Ah, yes, I was correct. 
they were uh, acquired by Autodesk, which is cool. They're all part of the same ecosystem now. You know, you could sort of grow with it, which I do like. But um, I would still probably stick with Onshape <laughs> if I were starting again because it's you know it's parametric. I love this uh, way of building where I sketch something and then extrude and sketch and extrude and fill it and chamfer. Um, I use those two tools so much, and obviously those are going to be part of many different uh, software uh, packages, systems that you can use <laughs> for CAD. But yeah. Mm. Now, is there anything that I haven't covered here? I'm getting a weird sense of deja vu that tells me that I'm forgetting something. But anyway, go check out the uh, project linked in the description, which you can uh, leave comments there if you want to ask me questions about anything that I forgot. Go check out the Jewel Thief original PCB, which you can order now from Onsha <laughs> from Oshpark via the link in the description of the project. Right here at the top of the project. Um, you can turn it into earrings, you can turn it into tea light holders, you can turn it into anything that you like, and I would love to see if you do. Uh, you can go download this model, go hack it, change it, whatever you want. Um, I did want to point out that I found I was looking for inspiration. This is a great way to find inspiration if you're like stuck on something when I was stuck on how to do the battery holder. Uh, I looked at these flex ones, but I couldn't figure out, I really wanted to find a way to print uh, the battery tensioning part clip as part of the main body, just have it all be one piece. I didn't uh, succeed in that, but you know what's cool? Since this is a removable piece, you could replace this with a longer one that allows you to use AAA batteries, which are a little bit shorter. Uh, I've got an example right here, actually. Um, so this won't work as is for AAA batteries, but you could easily just make a slightly larger one, a slightly larger clip that would hold that AAA battery. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, just finishing out our tabs here. Uh, sustain September is Sustainability Month on Hackster. Be sure to check that out. All the good stuff we have coming down the line. Lots of projects that people have shared should share your own projects here. I'd love to see more solar stuff. Love it. Um, our blogger Evan has published a list of environmentally pro published projects, some of our favorites that are already on the site. Go register for the Impact Summit. I'm going to drop that link in the description immediately upon wrapping this up. Uh, I'm using closed loop plastics, nebula black filament recycled super cool and maker tape you can get standard sort of this boring copper conductive tape can you tell that i'm biased it is actually really useful in this project though so you can get this regular copper tape uh all kinds of places online the nylon z-axis conductive all the way through conductive tape is a product of brown dog gadgets and i highly recommend it it's awesome and uh that's actually what i used usually with the jewel thief when i don't have it in a project, it's a nice thing that you can use to connect to the contacts of the PCB so that you can attach it to any size of battery, including CR2032s. I hooked up a CR2032 battery to the Jewel Thief circuit uh, using this, and it worked just fine. So uh, conductive tape is the name of the game. It's great. Um, yeah, go be sure to check all of that out. And of course, as always, be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any of this stuff. Get notified when we go live. And I'll see you twice next week. Hack on. <laughs>